1960s was a big decade for Peanuts. It was during this time that they made the TV specials, dozens of commercials, the subject of popular songs by the Royal Guardsmen, and appeared on countless merchandise. While the strip began in the 50s, it was the 60s where Peanuts became a household name. So what better way to end the decade with their first theatrical movie? A Boy Named Charlie Brown is a movie about failure. Specifically, it's about Charlie Brown's failures. The poor kid can't seem to succeed at anything. Whether it be playing baseball, flying a kite, or even tic-tac-toe. Linus does his best to offer words of encouragement, while Lucy does her best at making him feel worse. The Van Pelt siblings sure have a different way of treating Charlie Brown. One day, their class is holding the spelling bee. Lucy jokingly suggests to Charlie Brown that he should enter. Linus thinks it's a good idea. So with his encouragement, Charlie Brown enters the spelling bee. And to everyone's surprise, he wins. This allows him to enter the spelling bee for the entire school. With a little help from Linus and Snoopy, he spends the night studying. The next day, he wins the school spelling bee. For once, Fanes are starting to look up for Charlie Brown. The other kids start to respect him. Charlie Brown is happy to succeed at something. But he has no interest in taking it further. Lucy, however, has other plans. She recognizes that she can make a lot of money off Charlie Brown, so she decides to appoint herself as his agent. Well, at least she's willing to help, I guess. The others pressure Charlie Brown to enter the National Spelling Bee in New York. Even though he doesn't want to, Charlie Brown agrees. Just before getting on the bus, Linus gives Charlie Brown his blanket as a good luck charm. Linus later regrets this decision and he and Snoopy go to New York to get it back. Only Charlie Brown misplaced it. Although Linus has every right to be mad at him, I do think he was a little hard on Charlie Brown. He does have a lot of things on his mind that are more important than that blanket. After a pointless scene of Linus and Snoopy trying to find the blanket, it turns out it was at the hotel room the whole time. Charlie Brown does very well at the National Spelling Bee. The kids at home are watching it on TV, and they're cheering him on for a change. It boils down to him and one other kid. It looks like he could win. Then he misspells the word beagle. His dog is a beagle, and he misspells it. Lucy no longer wants to be his agent, because in her own words, owning 10% of Charlie Brown is 10% of nothing. That's a little harsh. He came in second place in the National Spelling Bee. That's still pretty good. Snoopy and Linus accompany the dejected Charlie Brown home. It was a good thing they were with him, for there was nobody there to welcome him home. Again, he came in second. That's a lot better than he usually does. Charlie Brown is so depressed about losing the spelling bee that he doesn't want to leave his bed. Linus comes over to let him know that everyone missed him at school. He then tells Charlie Brown he understands how he feels about losing the spelling bee. But then he adds, the world didn't come to an end. 
Charlie Brown decides to go outside. Sees Lucy holding the football. Runs to kick it. She pulls it away. He falls on his back. And Lucy then welcomes him back. In a warped way, that was pretty nice of her. A boy named Charlie Brown is the worst of the Peanuts movies. The story feels like it could have worked better as an hour-long special rather than a full-length movie. There are a lot of scenes like playing the national anthem, Schroeder playing his piano, and Snoopy pretending like he's a World War I flying ace that, while beautiful to look at, could have easily been cut out without affecting the story. The songs, while not bad, are not too memorable, besides the title song and I Before E, except After C. Does this mean A Boy Named Charlie Brown is a bad movie? Not at all. It was nice to see Charlie Brown succeed at something. Seeing the other kids start to believe in him was a nice change of pace. I also like how after losing, Linus tells Charlie Brown the other kids missed him at school. This shows they actually care about him, even after losing. Charlie Brown's decision to never leave his bed again after losing does feel relatable. Who hasn't felt like that? The message of a boy named Charlie Brown is its best part. It acknowledges that, yes, you will fail. No matter how hard you work, Sometimes, you will fail, and it sucks when you do. How many kids' movies are willing to say that? It may sound like a bleak message, but it offers hope. Just because you fail, the world doesn't end. There are other opportunities to prove yourself. You're only a loser if you give up. Some interesting facts about this movie is that it was the last time Peter Robbins voiced Charlie Brown. Though his AUG would be used for various characters up to the 90s. The instrument Snoopy plays is called a Jew harp, or a mouth harp. He would use it in other Peanuts movies, and it is now often called a Snoopy harp. A boy named Charlie Brown is like its title character. Not perfect, but still good. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later. There's a sick little girl named Lila in the hospital. She is feeling lonely. So she writes a letter to Snoopy, asking him to come visit her. Upon reading her letter, Snoopy packs his bag and wears his supper dish like a hat. I don't know why he did that, but it looks good. Snoopy leaves to visit her. But he isn't alone. He is accompanied by Woodstock in his animated debut. As they travel to the hospital, they encounter a crazy girl who looks like Marcy. She wants to keep them as pets, though she obviously doesn't know how to be gentle. This is by far the funniest part in the movie. I couldn't stop laughing at this girl's antics. They also get kicked out of various places due to the No Dogs Allowed sign. Phil Ravenscoff, best known as the voice of Tony the Tiger, would sing No Dogs Allowed. This would be the run on gag of the movie. Meanwhile, Charlie Brown and the gang 
begin to worry about Snoopy. They even start to feel guilty about the way they treated him. More importantly, Charlie Brown wants to know who is Lila. Linus did some research and found out that Lila was Snoopy's original owner. He then said, you gotta use dog Charlie Brown. No, Linus, he got a pre-owned dog. Anyway, Snoopy and Woodstock finally make it to the hospital to visit Lila. As she regains her health, Lila asks Snoopy to come live with her. Snoopy starts to cry. He feels torn between his loyalty to Charlie Brown and Lila. The fact that he doesn't want to leave Charlie Brown shows that Snoopy does love him. Not wanting to leave her alone, Snoopy chooses to go back with Lila. She allows him to go home to get his affairs in order. Snoopy leaves his croquet set and chess set to Linus and his record collection to Schroeder. The gang throws Snoopy a goodbye party. Everyone is crying, even Lucy. I guess deep down, she cares about Snoopy. It's at this party we see Franklin for the first time in animation. Snoopy goes to the apartment building and finds that there's a no dog allowed sign. For a change, he's happy to see it, especially finding out Lila owns a cat. The movie ends with everyone happy to see Snoopy, until he demands his stuff back. Snoopy Come Home is a big improvement over a boy named Charlie Brown. The story flows better, and none of the scenes feel pointless. It was nice learning about Snoopy's past, and I like how the movie shows that the characters do care about him, even if they don't always show it. The songs are memorable. This is due to the fact that they were written by the Sherman Brothers, who are best known for their work for Disney. Charles Schultz said that he wanted the movie to have a Disney feel. This is why he didn't get Vince Guaraldi. Schultz might have also been influenced by the criticism that the songs were dull in the previous movie. My favorite song is Fundamental Friend Dependability. It amazes me how that girl was able to say that several times in a row, when I can barely say it once. What I like most about Snoopy Comes Home is that it's a buddy movie. Snoopy and Woodstock have always been my favorite characters. So to have a movie that focuses so much on their friendship is a real treat. While not a box office hit, Snoopy Come Home is considered the best Peanuts movie. While I do think it's a great movie, I don't think Snoopy Come Home is the best one. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later. In 1974, Charles Schultz and his wife Jeannie took a vacation down the Rogue River in rafts. The trip was a disaster, as it rained constantly. It was from this event that Schultz got the idea for the third Peanuts movie, Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. The gang are on a bus heading for summer camp. After a brief stop, Charlie Brown gets left behind. He hitches a ride with Snoopy on the back of his motorcycle. I have to say, Snoopy and Woodstock look awesome. After the ride, Charlie Brown asked, 
Why can't I have a normal dog like everyone else? This always puzzled me. I know Charlie Brown often wishes Snoopy was normal. But this is one time where having a normal dog would be a bad thing. Since that would mean Charlie Brown wouldn't have gotten a ride. Anyway, once they arrive at camp, they meet some bullies with a vicious cat named Brutus. These guys win all the camp games every year. That's because they cheat. The big event is the river race. There are four teams competing. Team 1 consists of Charlie Brown, Linus, Schroeder, and Franklin. Team 2 consists of Peppermint Patty, Marcy, Lucy, and Sally. Team 3 is Snoopy and Woodstock. And Team 4 is the Bullies. Apparently, the Bullies are allowed to use a motorboat with a direction finder, radar, and sonar. Are they related to the camp counselor? Or are they bribing him? There's no way they should be allowed to have that high-tech stuff. The kids encounter several obstacles during the race. Some of it is due to the bullies cheating. But some of it is due to a storm. One storm caused Snoopy and Woodstock to get separated. As Snoopy tries to find his friend, the boys and girls try to find Snoopy and Woodstock. The characters are eventually reunited at a cabin. One thing I forgot to mention about the girls' team is that they vote on everything, no matter how small. Though Peppermint Patty only became leader after she cast the tie vote, meaning she got two votes. I don't know how that's fair, but this is Peppermint Patty we're talking about. Anyway, they vote to kick the boys out of the cabin, even though it's cold outside. Well, the girls have never been known for being nice. The next morning, the bullies come and destroy their rafts. So the boys and girls decide to join together. Charlie Brown is appointed leader. He proves to be a very effective leader. In fact, he behaves with more self-confidence than we usually see him. He openly talks back to Peppermint Patty when she's being unfair. He takes his role as leader seriously, and he doesn't let anyone get in his way. Charlie Brown sure grew a spine. It wasn't even his fault they lost a race. The girls accidentally knocked the boys out of the raft as they neared the finish line. The girls then fall over when they try to pull them up. The bully's boat sank after too much damage, and the cat punctured a hole in Snoopy's raft. So who won the race? Woodstock, on a raft made of twigs with a leaf for a sail. Brutus tried to destroy it, only to be hit by Snoopy. When he tried to attack Woodstock again, Snoopy decked him. Don't mess with Woodstock when Snoopy's around. The movie ends with Charlie Brown feeling proud of himself, only to get left behind again. He then hitches a ride with Snoopy and Woodstock. Race for your life, Charlie Brown. Is a great movie. While not the first time we see the characters at summer camp, it was never on such a grand scale. They have to deal with bullies as well as the elements. It felt very exciting to watch them overcome obstacles. I love how the movie gives Charlie Brown a bit of a character arc. His reason for coming to camp was to gain self-confidence and to become a leader. He definitely succeeded. It's rare to see Charlie Brown assertive. And to be honest, I found it refreshing. 
I also love how the characters didn't lose due to anything he did wrong. And surprisingly, nobody blamed him for the loss. In a strange way, the whole adventure felt like a victory for Charlie Brown. Sure, he got left behind again, but that only meant he could ride on the back of Snoopy's motorcycle. Unlike the previous movies, Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown isn't a musical. There are songs, but they don't play a huge role in the movie. To be honest, I think it works to the movie's advantage. Schultz really knew how to turn a disastrous vacation to his advantage. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments section what you guys think. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later. Charlie Brown, Linus, Marcy, and Peppermint Patty have been selected to go to France as part of the student exchange program. To his surprise, Charlie Brown receives a letter. He can't read it because it's in French. Lucky for him, Marcy is the only one who took the time to study French. The letter is from a girl named Violette on Fleur. She tells Charlie Brown that she's known him her whole life and wishes to meet him. So she invites him to stay at the Chateau of the Bad Neighbor. I don't know about you, but I don't think I want to stay at a place with the words Bad Neighbor in it. First they stop over in England, where Snoopy plays at Wimbledon. He gets himself thrown out for lashing out over a call the referee made. While this scene doesn't add much to the story, it's hilarious. They take a hovercraft to France. Once there, the kids rent a car, and Snoopy is their driver. Can somebody tell me why Charlie Brown wants a normal dog? Snoopy is able to drive him anywhere. How many dogs can do that? One scene I want to comment on is where they get in an accident. Marcy, I'm assuming, cusses out the other cars in French, while Snoopy does variations of the middle finger. I'm surprised they got away with this scene. Anyway, Marcy and Peppermint Patty are dropped off to stay with a boy named Pierre. It is from Pierre that we learn that the chateau is owned by a baron who hates strangers, especially foreigners. Pierre states that Charlie Brown and the others could be in great danger. I guess that's why it's called the Chateau of the Bad Neighbor. Charlie Brown, Linus, Snoopy, and Woodstock arrive at the Chateau. While it was sunny when they dropped Marcy and Peppermint Patty off at Pierre's, it's storming at the chateau. It's a legitimately spooky part. It gives you a feeling that they really are in danger. Unable to get an answer at the door, Charlie Brown and Linus end up sleeping in the stable. Snoopy is put in charge as their watchdog, but he and Woodstock end up partying at the cafe. Charlie Brown and Linus wake up to find blankets and breakfast. Who could have done it? They meet Marcy, Peppermint Patty, and Pierre just outside of school. Charlie Brown tells Pierre about the letter from Violette on Fleur. Pierre reveals she is the Baron's ward. If she invited him, the Baron doesn't know about it. Linus confronts Violette that night while the Baron is at the cafe. Despite her pleas, Linus refuses to leave until she explains herself. She shows him a bag that belonged to Charlie Brown's grandpa, Silas. 
During the First World War, Silas Brown was stationed at the Chateau, where he became close to Violet's grandma. It's hinted that the two were romantically involved. They lost contact some time after the war, but Violet's grandma never forgot about Silas. Upon learning that Charlie Brown is his grandson, Violet wrote to invite him to the Chateau. She didn't realize how angry she would make her uncle by doing this. Upon hearing her uncle's car, Violet panics. She accidentally knocks over a candle, causing the chateau to catch fire. Everyone bands together to put out the fire. The Baron is so grateful, he allows them to stay at the chateau. Bon Voyage Charlie Brown has always been my favorite Peanuts movie. Like Race for Your Life Charlie Brown, it takes the characters out of their element. This time, we see them in a foreign country. Going to a foreign country can be dangerous, especially if you're not familiar with it. Although I wouldn't call Bon Voyage Charlie Brown a scary movie, it does have a spooky atmosphere once they arrive at the chateau. I love how Violette simply wants to meet the grandson of the man her grandma always talked about. She does her best to make him stay comfortable, but her uncle hates strangers. The movie does a great job at conveying he's a dangerous man. I often wondered what would have happened if he caught Linus inside the chateau. The movie is really funny, especially the scenes with Snoopy. And the fire at the chateau is a heart-pounding scene. One thing I found interesting is that Schultz was stationed at a place called the Chateau of the Bad Neighbor in France during World War II. Like the characters, Schultz did slept in the stable. This would be the last Peanuts movie made in Schultz's lifetime, but there's one more to look at. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments section what you guys think, and don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later. Why didn't Schultz, Mendelssohn, and Melendez make any more movies after Bon Voyage, Charlie Brown? According to Lee Mendelssohn, they simply couldn't think of an idea for one. So for 35 years, there were only four movies. Then in 2015 came the Peanuts movie. There's a new kid to move into the neighborhood. Charlie Brown is excited for this new kid doesn't know about his various failures. It's a way to start with a clean slate. Who is this new kid? It's none other than the little red-haired girl. Charlie Brown is immediately smitten by her. He wants to go up and talk to her, but his shyness won't allow it. He's afraid she will only see him as a loser. The kids have to take a yearly standardized test. It's during this test that the little red-haired girl's pencil falls off her desk and ends up in Charlie Brown's possession. He notices that there are teeth marks on the pencil, meaning that she nibbles her pencil, just like him. So they have something in common. He would hold on to this pencil throughout the movie. A subplot shows Snoopy writing a novel about the World War I flying ace and his fight against the Red Baron. In it, he meets a girl dog named Fifi and falls in love. This novel actually ties in to what's going on in Charlie Brown's life. It never felt like filler, the way the scenes from a boy named Charlie Brown did. Anyway... 
Charlie Brown tries to impress the little red-haired girl. With some help from Snoopy. First, Charlie Brown enters the school talent show. He was to do a magic act. Once he sees everyone making fun of Sally's act, Charlie Brown decides to help her out instead. She wins first prize, while he gets an embarrassing picture printed in the school paper. Later, he learns that the little red-haired girl loves to dance. So with some dance lessons from Snoopy, Charlie Brown learns to dance for the school dance. He does very well, until he slips and falls, causing his shoe to fly off and hit the sprinklers, ruining the dance. Things are looking bad for Charlie Brown. Then the test scores are posted. It turns out that Charlie Brown got a perfect score. He basically becomes a celebrity, and Sally cashes in on his fame. Although he enjoys his newfound fame, Charlie Brown does wonder if people actually like him and not just the fact they think he's a genius. I'm impressed that the filmmakers didn't give him a fat head due to his fame. Anyway, Charlie Brown is assigned as the little red-haired girl's partner for the school book report. Only she's away taking care of her sick grandma. So Charlie Brown takes it upon himself to do the report by himself. He reads War and Peace, ignoring all requests to play just so he can focus on it. Later, Charlie Brown is about to receive an award for his perfect score. Once he finds out he accidentally switched test with Peppermint Patty, he admits it at the ceremony, rather than trying to hide it. How did Peppermint Patty get a perfect score? Dumb luck. As for the book report, Linus read it and felt Charlie Brown showed a deep understanding of a complex book, only to have that report accidentally destroyed. As usual, Charlie Brown can't catch a break. On the last day of school, everyone was to choose a pen pal. To his surprise, the little red-haired girl chose to be his pen pal. Why did she choose him? With some encouragement from Linus, Charlie Brown confronts her. It turns out that the little red-haired girl looked past his failure and saw what a sweet guy he is. He helped out his sister at the talent show. He helped Marcy at the dance. He confessed a mistake at the ceremony. And he did the book report by himself. Before she leaves for camp, Charlie Brown gives the little red-haired girl back her pencil. Fanes are now looking up. The Peanuts movie was the first movie I saw in theaters since Toy Story 3, and it blew me away. I was worried that it was just going to be a bunch of comic strips strung together, like the specials after Schultz's death, or something too different from the strip. To my surprise, it was neither. The Peanuts movie respects the legacy of Charles Schultz while telling a new story with his characters. Nothing felt like it didn't belong. Some might have issue with showing the little red-haired girl, but Schultz had done that in It's Your First Kiss, Charlie Brown. While Schultz never drew her in the strip, he did show her in silhouette. Her design in the movie was based on that silhouette. I love how she actually talks to Charlie Brown and acknowledges he's a sweet guy. I also love how the movie uses old recordings of Bill Melendez for Snoopy and Woodstock. Noah Schnapp, who voices Charlie Brown, would later play Will Byers on Stranger Things. I don't know what to make of that. There are many references to the old specials. It was pretty fun trying to spot them all. The movie was written by Schultz's son Craig and his grandson Brian. 
It also features his great-grandson, Micah Ravelli, as the voice of the little kid. So, in a way, the Peanuts movie is a family project. The characters do look good in CG. Even though I prefer them in traditional animation, the CG is beautiful. After the movie's release, the Schultz family admitted they weren't in a hurry to make a sequel. To be honest, I respect that. Sure, I would like to see another movie, but I like how they're not trying to milk the franchise. What I love about all the Peanuts movies is that they are self-contained stories. None of them are connected in any way. Whenever they get around to making another movie, I hope they follow that example. Now for my ranking for the Peanuts movies. Number one is a tie between the Peanuts movie and Bon Voyage Charlie Brown. Number two is Race for Your Life Charlie Brown. Number three is Snoopy Come Home. And at number four, a boy named Charlie Brown. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments section what you guys think. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later.